Hello? Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. Oh, okay. Yeah, bro. <laughs> I was worried. Sorry. I was worried. I was, I was worried. I was in the wrong chat room. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, Salaam Alaikum and uh, good afternoon, good morning. So, we will be starting the session in a um, few minutes. Prof, just give us like two, maybe two, three minutes. No, 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 don't worry, don't worry, no problem. I'm okay. Just let me know when I can. I need, I also need to test whether once I share my slide and everyone can see my slide. Yeah, you can test now. Oh, okay. Test. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh... Mm. Oh, I... Uh, uh, Safari... Uh, I'm using Safari. That's, that, does that mean it doesn't support, uh, Prof? Should I use Google? Uh, I think yes, because uh, yeah, we, we like if you can't share, then it will be quite. Oh, I can't share that, which means that I have. I tell you what, I have to go out and I, I have to go to Google Chrome, and then uh, I can share. Yes, yes. I think, I, think Safari, that... I think Safari doesn't support this. Okay, okay. Let, let me just okay. Give, me, give me a few minutes. Okay, bro. Okay, bro. So what, what do I do now? Shall I uh, exit? Yeah, you can exit and then uh, sign in. You uh, and using the same password. Yes. yes. Okay, 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 okay. All right, I will leave now.
Yes, Prof, we can see now the slides. Hello, Doctor Visa. Yes, yes uh, so Do I leave it there or do I take it up? Uh, the sharing, leave it there. Yeah, yes, yes, because we are going to start now. All right, uh, Alhamdulillah. Okay. So again, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Um, welcome again to the third day of the program, and today uh, we are having a Prof. Haroudin Soderman. Uh, Prof. K, he, is, uh, he will be talking on economic sustainability. And uh, Prof. K, he is an adjunct professor at UNITAR International University, and he's a visiting professor at DRB Highcom University. And uh, he's the chairman, exam board, uh, CL team, TM, and advisor. Uh, so, Prof. K, he was involved in uh, uh, several organizations, both on the academic uh, and also uh, the industry uh, uh, background. So, Brofke, uh, the floor is yours, and you can start the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Wisham. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Uh, uh, greetings, everyone, uh, wherever you are on uh, planet Earth. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Okay, um, I actually have a lot of things to do, <laughs> but Dr. Trisam has uh, uh, kindly uh, requested me uh, to share some of my thinking yeah, um, uh, on this very important subject, which is actually the important one of the most, uh, I would say, the fundamental concern for planet Earth, okay? sustainability, sustainability in every aspect of the world, political, social, economic, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, what I'm going to do, I have one about one hour, yeah, Dr. Wisam. I'm just going to share some slides. Right. I am going to share, share my slides. Uh, and I, you know, there's, there's so many ways to skin a cat. And, and you can go down uh, via so many uh, routes, so many roads. Um, you can take the normal road that people use, or you can take the roads uh, not taken by anyone else uh, before. Um, after looking at it, after, uh, um, well, you know, um, we first thing we do is we take a look at Mbah Google, I would call it, eh? Google, eh? Google Scholar and whatever that has been uh, written on it. And at the same time, I also look at Wikipedia. So what I'm going to share with you in the next uh, 40 or 45 minutes uh, or so would be how I look at economic sustainability. I always like to go back uh, into the epistemology a little bit and get the definition and then what is it all about you know you because as i said you can actually uh, evaluate uh, criticize you know uh, you can be critical about it or you can um, uh, assess or you can then synthesize depending again from di different schools of thought depending again from um, uh, what uh, discipline that you come from, whether you are from engineering or whether from the in, in, uh, social sciences. But I, what I'm going to do is, and again, uh, I my style is always, I have, um, uh, I've always taken a very eclectic uh, approach, which, meaning to say that I will take from this scholar, that scholar, this thinking, you know, that, that you know, what is going on, you know, from this industry and things like that. Then I will uh, throw it all out, out together. It's like a potpourri or like, it's like a Chinese dinner, if you may. Then it, it's up to you. Uh, which one that you like to take, which one that, that you enjoy most of all the dishes. So, okay, now let me just, uh, uh, um, without further ado, just move on to my first slide. Go. Oh. Okay. 
we live in a world where far too many people apparently believe that all deviation is standard. Calculus is only what the dentist scraps off one's teeth and logarithms are really just birth control methods for lumberjacks. I found it on my Facebook actually, which I read, I found it uh, um, quite some time back. Uh, very interesting, it's, by, uh, it's a quote by Stephen uh, Blattler, professor of mathematics, uh, Portland State University in Oregon. Okay, let me move on now. The concept of sustainability came from the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development, more commonly known as the Brantland Commission, after the name of its chairman, Gro Harlem Brantland, former Norwegian Prime Minister. Now, the commission set up in 1983 to address growing concern about the accelerating. Yeah? Uh, let me know if I'm going too fast, yeah? because I got about 200 slides. No, I'm just kidding. I just have about 20, 30 slides, okay? That should be enough to cover the subject area and then provoke you. And some of the things that I am going to, that I will raise or touch upon, uh, it will be picked up in greater detail by my friend, my colleague, uh, Professor Hassan, whom I can see him now. He's also watching me now. And his session will pick up. Because as I said, I would not go into all the, you know, uh, the econometrics, the data and all that. No, no, I will not. I'm not going to bore you all that. I'm just going to look at it from the helicopter view. Now, the commission set up in 1990 to address growing concern, okay? Uh, to address the growing concern about the accelerating deterioration of the human environment and natural, natural resources and the consequences of that deterioration for economic and social development introduced the idea of sustainable development, which it famously defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I think after what happened, you know, this unprecedented pandemic that is going on, it's not that it's not the first time we've already had so many before this, you know, and nobody really thought that something like this is happening and it's already happening in 2020. So it's already changing. Of course, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all those this pandemic thing. I think people are uh, already been bombarded a lot with about you know all this uh, uh, COVID, you know, th this virus thing. Okay, we had SARS before. We had uh, all kinds of you know H1 uh, N5 and five uh, and if you know, I'm sure you're you're you're, you're uh, familiar with it. Okay, let me move on. Okay, again. As a result, the United Nations came out um, uh, this 17 uh, global sustainable development goals. Okay, so you can see it covers poverty, hunger, good health, quality education, gender, uh, reduce inequalities, industry, innovation, decent work, affordable, clean, clean water, sanitation, sustainable cities, climate action, life below water, which is now everybody's talking about, you know, the blue economy. Life on land, peace and justice, partnerships for the goal, responsible consumption. So you see, they, they more or less, the United Nations has covered almost everything, actually. I don't think they've missed out anything. If there is, they probably come under one of those uh, 17 uh, very distinct, um, uh, what do you call, uh, sectors. Okay, let me move on again. Okay, okay, then I borrowed this from Process Street. Again, they go into the details of how do you want to, to be good. They are more, you know, but I just want to borrow uh, economic sustainability for success, what it is and how to implement it. Okay, if you guys who need to know more, you go to Process. Of course, uh, they are consultants. Already. I just want to highlight these three important things. People, profit, and planet. Socially progressive, environmentally conscious, and fiscally sound. In all my MBAs uh, and DBAs, this is the first thing that I tell them to do. The business world has changed. If you still go back and look at things, economically speaking, yeah, uh, just for profit, making money, I must tell you, um, you are taking a big risk. And um, you are slowly uh, preparing yourself for your own demise. Because all over the world today, if you look at big multinational corporations, big oil corporations, this is their mantra. It's not just a mantra. It, it is something that they believe in. And I think all of us are watching. And there's no more, people don't longer talk about uh, shareholder wealth. Now we are talking about 
stakeholder wealth, which means that who are the stakeholders? The planet, you, me, the customers, the employees, and the shareholders, as opposed to in the old days, we say that, why are we in business? Because we want to make sure that the shareholder makes money. Uh, Prof Hassan will go uh, into that detail. I will not uh, uh, what do you call, uh, disturb uh, his, his, his terrain. But what I'm going to say is that uh, people, uh, planet comes first, okay? And, and then the people and the profit, if, in that order. If you take care of the planet, if you, if, you, if you pay attention to environment, what is it that you're producing? What products are you producing? Uh, are they going to increase the carbon footprint? Are they going to increase the uh, planet, uh, the global warming as such? Then uh, you'll find that the ice in the North Pole or the South Pole melts and the sea level rise and a lot of cities will be uh, underwater. So if you're not contributing to all that, then, okay, the profits will come. All right, let me move on. Okay, this is my favorite again. Uh, we're talking about economics. Okay, I, again, I won't bore into the details of, of you know, uh, micro, macro, and then econometrics, all the data, blah, blah, blah. No, no. But I just want to, um, this is interesting. I like this. This was done by J. Bradford DeLong, a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. And he was assistant U.S. Treasury Secretary during the Clinton administration. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at Keynes. So, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm very much a Keynesian. I'm pro-government. Okay. And the other one is Friedman. Friedman, okay, a Keynesian is pro-government. Okay, let's look. What what is uh, Keynes uh, concept or Keynes idea? What what is his thinking? Now he says, enemy of laissez faire, free enterprise. Yeah? Okay, he is an enemy of laissez faire and advocate of public management. Clever government officials of goodwill could design economic institutions that would be superior to the market, or could at least tweak the market with taxes, subsidies and regulations to produce superior outcomes. Technocracy, skilled experts designing and fine-tuning institutions out of goodness of their hearts to make possible general prosperity. Bretton Woods, where the World Bank and IMF were created. So what he's saying is, look, it is not the private sector who created the World Bank, who created IMF. No, it is the government, smart government, senior government officers who crafted all this. So uh, again, I may remind you, don't uh, discount uh, the civil servants, the public sector. They are the very important lot. Okay, uh, which I, afterwards, I, when I, let me just talk about Friedman first. Now, Friedman is pro private sector. Now, he says, hey, you guys, don't disturb me, okay? Okay. Uh, private market interests were aligned with public good, he argued. Friedman, he died, I think, in 2007 or 2008. I'm not sure exactly. No, uh, for sure. I'm sure, which, but I know he's passed away. Now, government features were greater and more terrible than market failures, he argued. Friedman, I mean, okay? Uh, Milton Friedman. When market equilibrium was not the utilitarian social welfare optimum, and even when government could be used to improve matters from a utilitarian point of view, there was still an additional value in letting human freedom have the widest birth possible. So these are the guys who talk about, you know, uh, freedom and things like that. But the most important thing is uh, what Friedman is trying to say, hey, you guys, this government don't disturb us. Let the free hands of the market forces, the invisible hands of demand and supply, determine the fate of an organization or an outfit. If they are efficient, effective, and econo economical, then they will survive. And they are competitive, they will survive. Otherwise, if they are not efficient, they're not effective, no, uh, they will uh, disappear, they will die, and somebody else, you know, come come back, or come, come, or, or emerge. Okay, that was Friedman's thinking, right? Uh, if you look at the US, they're very much, uh, the thinking is very much uh, Milton Friedman, okay? Uh, um, okay. What I wanted to add on to this is because, which brings me now to an, another uh, economic thinking uh, about governments. Um, I remember the, our former prime minister, when he was prime minister for 22 years, okay, he used to tell all the top civil servants to read this book. It's called Reinventing the Government. Uh, it's by Gabler and Osborne. Uh, and uh, okay, you can Google it and you can read about it later on, but okay, save you the trouble of reading it. I will just summarize for you. His book has three important theses. Thesis number one is you must never outsource to or let anybody else uh, handle 
things that are important strategically for the security, safety, and sovereignty of your nation, your country. Number one, he says, you have to do it. For example, military, education, health, you have to do it. You don't outsource it. Okay. His second thesis was, some things in, the, in your country, yes, you can give it, or you can outsource it, uh, to uh, others. In other words, you can allow uh, the, uh, as what Friedman said, you can allow the invisible hands of the market forces, invisible hand of demand and supply to determine your fate. That is it. That is uh, Gabler and Osborne's second thesis. Now, his third thesis is if the nation uh, is economically good, makes money, the GDP is good, you know, growth rate of uh, 10%, 15%, or 20%, what, how do you give back? To your citizens, to the country, okay. In any government, okay, doesn't matter where you are in anywhere in any part of the world. There are three fundamental sectors: the public sector, the private sector, and the cooperative sector. So, according to Gabler and Osborne, his thesis was their thesis was the best way to give back to the society, to the nation, is through the cooperative movement. For example, if you give back to a company. For example, I'm the MD of company. I have two shareholders and I have 10 employees. You give me, okay, say uh, one US dollar. What happened is um, 80 cents uh, would have been, I would have taken away first. So 40 cents uh, for me, 40 cents for my partner, which leaves 20 cents and that 20 cents will be divided among the 10 employees that I have as an example. Okay. Now, if you give it to the government, most of it will be enjoyed by the civil servants. Then he said, if you give it to the cooperative sector, more people will enjoy it. For example, what is the number of military co-ops? Who are members of military co-ops? How many? In thousands, right? What about the police? In thousands. What about the uh, fire brigade? And what about the teachers? And what about the other uh, civil servants? You know, they have their co-ops. So co-ops, actually, when you give a dollar, more people, if there are, say, 500,000 uh, uh, members, of, uh, uh, say, the police force in a particular country, and you give them one ringgit or one dollar, 500,000 people will benefit. So that was what uh, Gabler and Osborne uh, was trying to elucidate, was trying to propagate, okay? His, his notion of about, uh, again, in the general overview of economics, okay? Let me move on, okay. Uh, okay, now. Whether Keynes or Friedman was more right in their deep orientation eh, economically, okay, the tension between their two views, the two economic views, okay, has been a very valuable driving force for human progress over the past hundred years. Okay, okay I, I'm giving you uh, the, the 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 background, okay, the, the, on on economy, on economics, okay. Now, okay, then I want to borrow some things uh, from the World Economic Forum. It's very interesting. This involves uh, everyone, big, huge corporates, uh, governments, uh, leaders, and you know, things like that. Okay. Okay. Now, the 50th World Economic Forum, team stakeholders for a cohesive and sustainable world, was held from 21 to 24 January in Davos, in Switzerland. The theme highlights World Economic Forum's founder Klaus Schwab's idea that companies must create benefits for all stakeholders: customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. Okay, the focus for this year was on, see that, sustainable investment and how to make businesses more climate friendly. So you see, they are also thinking about how to sustain. When you talk about investment, you talk about business, we talk about economics, okay? Which comes first, business comes first or economics comes first? There's always been this argument, okay? When I look around now, in some universities, they call the faculty, faculty of business. And the economics comes underneath. In some universities, they have the faculty economics. So uh, business, uh, invest, finance comes under economics. So which is which now? Okay, depending again on which school. And, uh, and, and, and what, how do you perceive it? Uh, is economics more powerful than, and, and say that business is a subservient uh, to, to economics? Or business is more powerful, so therefore it's a business school, so economics is subservient. It's just another discipline under the gambit of business. Okay, let, let, think about it. Okay, and when I say all these things, these are the things that I want to provoke your thinking. All right, in a report released earlier, the World uh, Executive uh, Forum, okay, uh, sorry, the World Economic Forum said severe threats to the climate 
account for all of the top five long-term risks. What are they? Failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, extreme weather events, environmental damage, biodiversity loss, and natural disasters such as earthquakes and tsunamis. Okay, for this forum, 300,000 uh, participants from, sorry, 3,000 participants, excuse me, uh, for slip of the tongue, it's not a fault of the mind, okay, from around the world, converge to assist governments and international institutions, track progress towards the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals, and facilitate discussions on technology and trade governance. Let's move on. Okay, what is, okay. This topic again, it's a tricky topic. You know, why is it a tricky topic? Okay, this is interesting. Sustainability issues dominated the global policy agenda. However, bridging the chasm between profits and the greener approaches is a tricky topic. For example, US President Donald Trump withdrew from the Paris climate deal, arguing that the rigid climate policy targets penalize US businesses. businesses. That's his thinking. I don't know whether the, the business leaders uh, in his country uh, agrees with what he's thinking. Okay, I, I leave that for him. Okay, let's not pay too much attention to the US, but they're very important, okay? Uh, whatever it is, we must not forget that they provide the funding for a lot of the world bodies, okay? We must always be mindful of that. Now, discussions and presentation revolve around six interconnected topics. Technology, how to create global consensus on deployment of fourth industrial revolution technologies. I'm sure again everyone is familiar with of the fourth IR. Okay, healthcare using technology to improve medical facilities diagnosis. Ecology, how to mobilize business to respond to the risk of climate change and protect the biodiversity. Okay, society, how to reskill and upskill people in the next decade. Geopolitics, how the spirit of Davos can create bridges to resolve conflict. But the most important thing, that's why I put it in in, in bigger fonts and in red economy status of the global economy and how it can be improved. Let's move on. Okay. The economics of it all. Okay. The global economy is at a crossroads. Rising inequality, trade wars, disruptive technologies and climate change threaten economic growth at the start of this decade. Yeah, pandemic, you know, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Google uh, Corona, okay, the COVID. Uh, it has actually uh, not only threatened, it has triggered okay, uh, an unprecedented, we are now, you know, with new normal. Oh, talking about new normal, uh, I, I almost wanted to wear my um, uh, face mask. <laughs> okay. But I forgot I'm online. All right. Now, the Global Risk Report 2020 states that the global economy is facing an increased risk of stagnation. All while citizens worldwide protest political and economic conditions and voice concerns about systems that exacerbate inequality. Okay. Let me move on again. Okay. According to the report, the need of the hour is a transition to a greener, more equitable economy for productivity and sustainable growth. Okay, the IMF has some specific policy recommendation. It calls for stronger multilateral cooperation, especially in the areas of trade, cybersecurity, and the effort to curb climate change. According to the IMF, countries must enhance inclusiveness, ensure that safety nets protect the vulnerable, and use governance structures to strengthen socio-economic cohesion. Okay, all the big words, okay? What is sustainable development? Sustainable development is a broad terminology that is inclusive to all forms of growth in maintaining needs for present generations without compromising future generations, which we saw already at the outset, you know, the, what it all means uh, to come as defined by the UN. We saw it uh, in, in my first slide. It is also one of the focal points in the subject of environmental conservation and regulation. It can also be defined as a study and maintenance of ecological balances in terms of resources and how natural systems function. Okay, let's move on. The three pillars, economic pillar, after you can read this, okay, I will share this slide with you. The economic pillar has the most innovative potential to combine sustainable practice, technology, and money-making tools. So that is it. So you have the environmental pillar, you have the social pillar, but the economic pillar, that's why I purposely um, put it in uh, bigger fonts. It's an important pillar, okay, which can help the environmental pillar, which can help the social pillar. They are interrelated. Okay, how sustainable development is relevant to the 21st century. Okay, you can read all that. I won't go through it, right? 
okay uh, some micro farming options and stuff like that okay these are some of the areas okay okay this is an artist rendition of the nordic aqua farm proposed setup for the Belfast facility, the tanks will measure 8,000 cubic meters or more than three times the size of the Olympic swimming pool. So this is some of the things that they're experimenting, okay, uh, to address uh, sustain economic sustainability using technology and all the latest, okay? Right, okay. What are the four E's of sustainability? It was actually three E, but I added another E. While many community dynamics are at work, Four are particularly important to building healthy and prosperous communities over the long term. Economy, ecology, equity. That was original. Okay. I added ethics. Okay. Economy is the management and the use of resources to meet household and community needs. So you need all these three. Like in those days, what if we talk about the three is right? Economic uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. Uh, that was 20 years ago. But now, uh, it's no longer the 3E. E. It's a 4E. E. It's efficiency, effectiveness, economy, and the fourth one, ethics. There is, um, I would say, um, um, I would say, there is an enormous awareness all over the world about ethics. If you look at all the young children all over the world, sorry, the young people, not young children, all over the world, and you look at all, a lot of it uh, is, is uh, this, they seem to be paying attention on, they want things to be transparent. They want to know if they drink their coffee, the Starbucks, where was it manufactured? Where, where was the coffee planted? Was it in a legal uh, area somewhere uh, or some illegal contraband uh, in deep in the forest of Amazon? Whether the coffee is there, but the Starbucks uh, bought it from there. Now, if they find out that Starbucks buy from contraband uh, uh, places like that, they will make a lot of noise. So, in other words, there is a lot of awareness and concern for uh, being uh, for honesty, transparency, and ethical. I wrote a paper in 2008 uh, for the Malaysian uh, Institute of Marketing Journal. Uh, it's called redefining ethics and morality in marketing. And I paid attention a little bit on the legal context of ethics. Very interesting, okay? What is uh, ethical uh, to you or to your society or to in your legal jurisdiction may not be so in another legal, legal jurisdiction. I give you an example. For example, you know, if someone you know, is like a vegetable on the deathbed, all you need to do is switch off uh, uh, the power of the machine that's keeping it like, dead anyway, it's like a vegetable. If you switch it off, in some legal jurisdiction, that's not allowed. That is wrong and uh, it, it's an offense. And that is uh, manslaughter, it's murder. But in some societies in Europe, in, in some legal jurisdiction, it's okay. If you do that, uh, it's called uh, euthanasia or mercy killing. Okay, you can Google and check it out. Uh, which country uh, allows that? Okay, just I just wanted to um, expand a bit on on the word ethics. Okay, let me move on. Okay, don't worry about this. Okay, social sustainability economics. You can see that when we talk about economy, we're talking about smart growth, long range planning, cost saving. Okay, uh, R and D spending and cost of living. Okay, let me move on. What is economic sustainability again? Let's revisit. Economic sustainability can refer either to the continued success of an economy over time, or more recently, to the way an economy operates in a sustainable manner, protecting social and environmental elements. Quite a mouthful, right? Okay, again, different people uh, define it or look at it from a different context or from a different approach. Okay. Conceptions of economic sustainability are interlinked and should be considered together to gain a more holistic understanding. Now, the Twin Center defines economic sustainability in its traditional sense as the ability of an economy to support a defined level of economic production indefinitely. Okay. Let me move on. Okay. Now, consider another definition for the term economic sustainability. This is from uh, University of Mary Washington, economic sustainability. Okay. Economic sustainability refers to practices that support long-term economic growth 
without negatively impacting social, environmental, and cultural aspects of the community. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Oh. oh okay. Uh, it's only uh, 4.40, but I'm already towards the, uh, coming to the end of <laughs> my presentation. So, uh, okay. So, so now I'm on the start uh, of my parting remarks, but it, it's going to be quite a few slides, <laughs> quite, quite a lot of parting remarks, unfortunately. Okay, now. The world economy is badly affected by the pandemic. Hence, some countries may have to liquidate their assets, such as gold and many long-term securities, example, government bonds, etc. This can result in further deterioration and quick decision from the world economic giants to come up with economic aid programs in order to sustain the situation. That's why the big red word, economic sustainability. So, economic aid programs can be in the form of Return of debts to the debtor nations, providing economic aid, technical support to redevelop poor nations, for an example. Okay, let's move on. Now, let's also revisit some of what we have repeatedly bandied around. We've been talking a lot about, about industrial RR 4.0 and stuff like that. Okay, but perhaps in order for us to ensure economic sustainability, we also need to pay attention to some of these opportunities that are available now because of technology. Some of the salient uh, things that people are doing now in some parts of the world, for example, digital ethics. We need to pay because we are now in a digital economy, everything is online. So we need to ensure that those people who, you know, who write your programs, uh, the algorithms, advanced algorithms that again um, results in predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, those data ethics, digital data ethics is fundamental. We have to pay attention to it. Okay. Number two, human-centric design when it comes to artificial intelligence. Otherwise, uh, we will be producing uh, robots. We will be producing a, a robots with in, in artificial intelligence, which are which will be better than us. Okay, latest that I read. Um, the latest artificial in all this while we we, we the research showed that you know um, robots uh, have very bad or they don't have they have don't have the ability. The machine learning there is bad, but they just discovered that. Oh my God, the robots, they learn better and faster than human beings. Can you know what that means? Okay, I'll give you a simple example. In fact, I've been saying this a lot in some of the sessions. I had uh, um, my uh, University of Hull alumni reunion this couple of months uh, ago, early in the year, okay, before the, before the pandemic. And uh, someone from Singapore asked me, uh, what do you think? You know, because they were talking about technology, IT, blah, blah, this thing. And I smiled and I said, do you know that, you know, we look at all our young people, they're busy with the smartphones, you know, and they're busy with the iPads. And when grandchildren comes to the house, uh, they don't uh, hug at their grandparents and say, uh, Grandpa, we miss you so much, you know. Okay? You know what they'll do? You can ask uh, some, I'm sure there's some grandparents here. They will cry and come back and say, Grandpa, the Wi-Fi is off, it's out. So technology seems to be more important than, than him or her missing his or her grandpa. That seems to be a global phenomenon. Okay. So when I'm looking at that, and I look at my own grandchildren when they were on the iPad and when they are on the smartphone, you know, you know, you know what came to my mind? And I told this to a few professors from my university at Hull, and, and they, they nodded their head and in agreement. I said, do you realize that we are unawaringly preparing our young people, our toddlers, okay, to be slaves to future robots? Think about it. Okay. Now, again, uh, number three, uh, we need to also, uh, at the context of smart city and sustainability, okay, and smart community. So these are the things that uh, that is that is uh, happening, okay, that we may like to look at for economic sustainability, yeah. And uh, okay, take a look. Go to Songdo, South Korea, and even in Singapore, they are examples of the world's benchmark smart cities. They are doing it even as I'm speaking right now. They have incorporated and they are preparing to incorporate all those that that I've mentioned. This is slide, this slide, the previous slide. Okay, uh, the things that we need to pay, look at. Okay, regeneration. Okay, I just want to introduce 
uh, another concept. It is very interesting, which I, I just happened to uh, bump into it uh, on my Facebook. Very interesting. I like this. Regeneration. Okay. Regeneration is a paradigm drawn from living system. Just like uh, uh, some of the organizations, um, uh, you know, they, uh, when we study about, about, about organizations, we look at them, you know, um, like um, the concept, okay? Uh, how it works, how it relates to each other. Uh, if, if you look, even if you look at uh, Microsoft when it first began, uh, what was their strategy? What was their model? Uh, they were looking at how they are going to expand and they grow. Um, a lot of it uh, by looking at the, at the at the biological system, you know, finding a market niche and looking at the place and see what happens. Okay, look at the, uh, you know, it, well, go, go go and read about it. Okay, uh, a lot of it is looking at uh, the um, uh, no, complexity theory, you know, the, the, the chaos theory, and also uh, living systems. Okay, okay. Now, the principles of regeneration radically differentiates the paradigm from sustainability, circularity, and an extractive mechanistic mindset. Okay, uh, mechanistic mindset or a straight line linear thinking, uh, okay? To differentiate, because I'm a social scientist, but I, uh, in my early, in my younger days, I was a biology student. So my uh, pure science thinking is, is helps me a lot in the way I think, in the way I look at how systems work. And, and, and like uh, my apologies, eh? I'm sure there are a lot of engineers, eh? Dr. Wizam, uh, the, 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 the mathematician, the engineers, they all, uh, in a sense, threat in uh, linear thinking, okay? Uh, which uh, <laughs> reminds me of a joke, <laughs> uh, which uh, I just posted on my Facebook. It's a story about uh, two professors who were jogging. One was a maths professor, and the other one was an engineering professor. So the maths professor was holding a uh, like a calculator, and the engineering professor was holding something, you know, like a sundial or something like that. And they were in front of the faculty, and uh, uh, they were chatting. And all of a sudden, an English professor passed by. The English professor passed by and then said, hey, hello guys. I said, uh, what, what are you doing? And then the, the, the engineering professor and the mathematics professor said, hey, you English professor, don't disturb us, okay? We are busy thinking. Uh, we are trying to determine the height uh, of this flagpole in front of the faculty. So the English professor was looking at the, at the two professors and looking at the flagpole. And then he said, huh, what's so difficult? I'll get it for you. So he ran into the faculty and went and uh, got somewhere, got a measuring tape, came out, took the flagpole, put it on the ground, and then he measured it. And then put back the uh, flagpole back, and then uh, what do you call it? And, and look at the uh, maths and, uh, and, and mathematics and the engineering says, There you go, there you go. I got it for you. Then he went off, uh, gave back the tape uh, inside the faculty, and then went off to continue his jogging. And he was going away, the mathematics professor. And uh, and the engineering professor looked at each other and sneered and said, hmm. "English professor, we are trying to determine the height of the pole. He gave us the length. Okay, <laughs> let me move on. Okay, okay. Uh, where was where, where where was I? Okay, mechanistic mindsets. Okay, and then business economics have an incredible opportunity to produce impact. See." I purposely uh, uh, bolden or, or change the font to make it bigger. Businesses play a unique role in society. They are simultaneously employers, investors, and developers, and can guide social systems and governance towards regeneration. I'm sure my good friend, Prof. Hassan, afterward will move in when he talks about uh, the business component and the entrepreneurship uh, component, how, okay, all this, uh, the role that they play, governance and things, stuff like that, okay? Let me move on. Okay, okay. see, oh, I had some, uh, I still have some uh, ending notes. Should we, I have 10 more minutes, okay. Should we be asking this question now of the big picture, which requires a bigger solution or what? Okay, okay. Economics as a study is very new as compared to say medicine, centuries old, okay. And even accountancy more than 200 years ago. The study of economics 
at the heart of its origin was most likely about distribution, distribution of wealth of necessities. So basically all revolving around that, about demand and supply and stuff like that, okay? Uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, okay. Now, in a time like this, perhaps we should be thinking basic. In Malaysia, for instance, after the uplift of the moratorium, we, we have moratorium now, okay? 30th of September 2020, we can expect, okay, this is uh, the, some of the, my views and some of the views of my friends, okay? All hell will break loose, excuse me for the language, okay? Banks and financial institutions will be chasing monies from borrowers who don't have them and practically impossible to comply with payment schedules. The so-called pandemic does not affect those affected by bankers and authorities' definition, okay, of illness, retrenchment, etc. But it has a domino effect on many others who seemingly are not affected on the surface. Okay. To be sure, the pandemic shall result in the rich being richer and the poor being poorer and pull down many in the middle class. Okay. Even at the outside, I already talked about it. It's all about, you know, um, inequality, the widening global inequality gap. That's what economics is all about. When you talk about economics, we talk about inequality. Okay. A greener, more equitable economy. A greener, more equitable economy for productivity and sustainable growth sounds like a mouse of nice to have and can happen provided it sticks to supporting basic needs for food and shelter essential services. These are amongst areas that may be worth looking into as people will still spend on basic necessities and services. How optimum are these being delivered? Are there application of technologies to make it more efficient and effective? Are they reasonably priced or can we get cheaper solution or lower prices for electricity and power? For internet and electronic and electrical gadgets, blah, 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 what have you. With this pandemic, I fear the global BOP, BOP, base of pyramid, and for each country, wherever you might may be coming from, would have grown thereby undoing all the efforts by each government, your government, okay, over the last two or three decades. Okay. Now, let's look at Martin Armstrong, the economic forecaster. He said that in his study of cycles, that we are in a cycle of war and political upheaval in many countries. It is only right that the opportunities to find solutions for the lower income group will be where the opportunity and money is. Okay be it in microfinancing, microinsurance, affordable housing, affordable means, etc. Like, like. But it's also challenging time for technology innovation as grants and funding generally are getting scarce and trimmed down. Now, talking about you know, you know, technology in, in, innovation, I just finished my uh, technology innovation and entrepreneurship class you know, for my DBA students at uh, UniKL uh, postgraduate. So I saw that, oh, technology innovation. Yes, and they're right. So I was just you know, uh, talking about it. It may be something for us not to come up with something original for the sake of it, but by adopting and adapting success case studies of different parts of the world. For the recent past, for example, the IT world would have been enhanced by what Estonia has done. They became the world's number one IT, IT attention now with more than 20 government applications online. It takes minutes and hours instead of days and weeks to get government to deliver their services to their citizens. You can have virtual corporation registered with them and cryptocurrency exchange licenses very quickly too. In uh, uh, Estonia, okay, check it out, Google it, okay. Perhaps it is time to think simple and think local. How can I, my neighborhood community, benefit instead of a global one size fit all solution in whatever we do? Most would not be thinking beyond survival and self-sufficiency. So, at the end of the day, it's all about looking out for your neighbor and efforts at narrowing the widening global economic inequality gap. Is there anything more? Okay, I'm done. That's my epilogue. Okay, so uh, I have summarized uh, my favorite slide. That's what I've just been sharing with you, okay, eclectic, I will pick up here and there and all that, put it all together and for you to think about it, all right? Okay. It could be said of me uh, in this presentation uh, about 50 minutes ago, <laughs> I have only made up a bunch of other men's flowers, providing of my own only the string that ties them together. Montaigne, 1533, 1592.
French moralists and essays. All right, I'm done, uh, uh, Dr. Resham. Okay, that's my okay. last. Uh, that's my last slide. Okay, just to tell them that I I was uh, I'm not just only talking, but I, I to, just to reinforce what you said earlier. I had uh, two awards, you know, Blue Ocean Best CEO in Bali, and I I got the Asia HRD Award in two one three. All right, I'm back to you now. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rishan, for inviting me and for allowing me uh, to share my views on economic uh, sustainability. Over to you, Dr. Rishan. Thank you so much, Prof. K, uh, for your interesting uh, lecture and uh, session. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, Prof. You will stay with us for until uh, the end if there is any discussion later on. Yeah, yeah, why not? I'm free, so I can, uh, if, uh, because I also want to listen to what Prof. Hassan, uh, okay. she, she's already sharing his slide. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, Prof. You are welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. So now we move on to the next uh, session uh, by Prof. Muhammad Hassan Muhammad Osman, and he will be talking on green business uh, concepts and business model for sustainability. So, uh, Prof. Hassan, he is currently a professor at Al-Shad Ayyub Graduate Business School at uh, University Technology uh, Malaysia, MARA, uh, UIT Amsha Alam. Uh, he was previously a visiting professor at uh, GRB Highcom University of Automotive Malaysia, and he is a former professor at Al-Zman Hashim International Business School in UTM Malaysia. And he, is a, a, he was a former deputy vice chancellor for academic and international at University of Malaysia, Kelantan. Um, so welcome, Prof. Hassan. Uh, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In Malaysia, it's about 5 p.m. at the moment. So we are preparing for a very early dinner today. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Vesam and, and all the other participants who are in uh, this group at this moment. I see about 150 participants from all over the world, uh, from Tanzania, from the Philippines, from Indonesia, and also Pakistan. Yeah? That shows that we are very concerned uh, uh, as to what is happening uh, around us. And thank you so much uh, my, to my good friend, Professor K, as we call him, or Professor Khairuddin. Uh, he always um, considers himself as the Van Diesel of Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, and and uh, it's quite highly thing. We, I, I had some earlier discussion with him so that we do not um, sort of like duplicate our presentation. And we have agreed that he will focus on the economic aspect of uh, sustainability and I will focus on the business aspect of sustainability. It's quite interesting because at the moment I'm in my hotel room. Um, we are, I'm now attending a workshop on uh, developing a skills uh, for technopreneur in Malaysia. And it happened that this morning we discussed about the issue of sustainability for new business startup. It's quite interesting. Uh, it really coincides with what uh, we are discussing today. Uh, today. And, uh, and the interesting part is that um, we just realized that the issue of sustainability has become so important that um, uh, the, the, the recent uh, COVID-19 epidemic has put us on a reset, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let me start with this. Uh, how do I get to, Okay, how do I move to the next slide, right? Uh, okay. If you look at this uh, slide, for example, this is a, a photo which I think most of us have seen, the before and the after lockdown, right? The first photo is in India. Uh, you can see the, the situation of, in, uh, of that location in India uh, before the lockdown, so foggy and everything. And uh, during the lockdown, or after the lockdown, you can see how clear the sky is. Same thing in, in Italy, Milan. Uh, you can see how the, the situation is. It's so, it's so foggy and, uh, and you can see a clear sky next to it. Now, what does it tell us? It shows that um, what has, has, has man been doing to our, our beautiful earth, right? Um, 
and 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 that that is why I've said earlier that the COVID nineteen has sort of like uh, asked us to reset, rethink. Right? What have we been? What have we been doing uh, uh, to maintain the sustainability of our Earth, especially as far as uh, if we are in the uh, if we are if if, if we are um, managing our own businesses. Now, uh, this is a tragic incident that happened in Malaysia last year, where on March the 7th, uh, 2019, a river known as Kim Kim River in the state of Johor, south of Malaysia, experienced a severe incidence of toxic pollution caused by illegal chemical waste dumping into the river right, by one uh, private company uh, in an area called Pasigudang of Johor. Now, what happened? The illegal dumping released toxic fumes affecting 6,000 people and, uh, and hospitalizing almost 2,775, where most of the victims were school students, right? And 110 schools located within that area were subsequently closed. So you can see the effect on the uh, school children where uh, they, they were not able to go to schools and uh, some of the businesses within that area has to close down because of the uh, because of the action by this uh, this uh, ir irresponsible company, right? And then then came the issue of now why why do we need a sustainable business model? Now based on what on, on the previous two incidents, right? You can see the the, the condition of our planet Earth uh, before and after COVID nineteen, and also. Uh, what happened to Malaysia uh, last year, especially to the Kim Kim River, um, most business organizations have started to do a reset. Uh, they have to, they started to think, I think we need uh, a better business model uh, that uh, focuses on sustainability of the environment. Now, before this, we were only thinking about making money. We were thinking about profit. And then we realized that no, uh, profit alone is not enough. Right, we have to start thinking about at the same time trying to save uh, planet Earth. As Prof K or Prof Kamal have said earlier, the younger generations they are very transparent. Right, they would like to know uh, where does these uh, resources came from. Even my son, for example, when he sees a, a tree being cut down uh, to make way for for building of highways or buildings, you can see tears coming from his eyes. Right, because to him he says that trees remains there forever. Right, whereas building they can go down at any time, and um, so the concern now um, is getting stronger and stronger among the younger generation. So, based on a recent report, uh, this is from the World Economic Forum, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC warned that without rapid and far-reaching changes. To how land, energy, industry, building, transport, and cities are managed, the damage to our planet cannot be could be irre irreversible. We cannot reverse the damage that has taken place uh, to our planet Earth. So basically, we need to reset. We need to rethink, right? Uh, we need to make changes on how uh, we manage, right? Our land, our energy, our building, our transport, and how do we manage our cities? Okay, now this message is quite clear. We need a cooperative effort, as Prof. Karudian has said earlier. We need a cooperative effort uh, on a global scale to change our current traje trajectory. Right? It's high time to reset. Okay, high time to look at. Even uh, I've, uh, I saw a photo of the, uh, the the canal, the Venice Canal. Right? It's so crystal clear. Uh, this is something that we have not seen for the last couple of years. Even during the lockdown in Malaysia, uh, my, my hobby is photography. Um, it was quite interesting because I began to see birds which would never flew within my, 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 my residence. Right? I was so happy because I was able to take uh, photos of uh, birds yeah, within that area, which I've never, never seen before. Now, given that many of the toughest sustainability challenges the world faces um, are linked uh, to how does how it does business, and the only prudent way forward is to change how business is done. 
Therefore, we need a business model for sustainability. Now, we are not talking about not we are not thinking just about sustainable business model, but we are also looking at business model for sustainability. Now, we are as as I'm talking to you, my groups of uh, uh, my groups of uh, participants in the workshop uh, downstairs are now discussing about a business model for sustainability. We need to relook, we need to rethink, right? We need to see how we can develop our business model with a priority on sustainability. Now, let's talk about the SDGs framework. I think most of us are quite familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, right? That was uh, set up by United Nations way, way back in September 2015. Uh, it is now being ad uh, adopted by 193 countries designed to achieve a more sustainable future for all by the year 2030, which is not far from, 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 from us now, which is about 10 years from now, which by extension will enable a better business environment, right? So the Business Sustainable uh, Development Commission has estimated that uh, in, uh, in meeting the SDGs, right, this could add an additional uh, could add some 12 trillion US dollar and provided and provide 380 million jobs to the global economy by the end of the next decade. So basically its contribution is huge, right? Now, this is something very interesting because I, I won't take much of the time because I think I would prefer uh, uh, we focus on uh, discussion after this. Um, the, the, as, as what is happening now, because of the Kim Kim uh, River incident last year, and also because of the SDGs that's being introduced, uh, we see that the private sector is beginning to focus on the connection between profits and sustainability. Now, previously we talked only about profits. We don't care about sustainability, right? We, we, the only thing that we talk about social uh, contribution is only CSR, right? And even some people consider CSR is a form of marketing tools rather than uh, something that contribute back towards the uh, society. So according to the uh, Ethical Corporation Latest Responsible Trends report, 69% of business executives surveyed say that they are integrating SDGs into, into their strategies. I think this report has been about for the last two years and uh, I, I presume that there is some increase in the percentage of, uh, of, of the uh, companies that are integrating SDGs into the strategy. At the same time, the number of companies receiving a B corporate certification, which measures as firms, social and environmental and performance has increased in recent years. So we, as we can see, um, we are not talking about awareness, but we see more and more companies has begin uh, to move and has begin to implement the, the SDGs into their business model. They are more concerned now than before. Um, and based on a, a Deloitte millennial survey, almost 40% of respondents stated that the goal of business should be to improve society, right? As you can see that it has, um, it, it, it has become number two, right? Previously it was profit at the top, now we have um, number one is to generate jobs, and number two is to improve society. So as you can see, the awareness and the, 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 the need um, is there. And another study by Intelligent Group, 64% of millennials said it was a priority for them to make the world a better place, while 88% want a work-life integration, right? Now, uh, based on the lockdown, uh, we see more and more people are working from home. This is what happened now to my university. We are having difficulty trying to bring back people to work. Uh, they prefer to work comfortably at home, right? Um, at this moment in Malaysia, for example, our universities um, has not uh, opened yet for the senior students. So what happened now is that the new students have just been uh, enrolled into the universities and most probably the senior student will start coming back somewhere in December of this year. So what you can see is that uh, when you have less people in cam on campus, um, 
you see that uh, the, 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 uh, the environment is still clean. Um, you see less garbage being thrown all over the campus and, uh, uh, and you enjoy going to campus. But uh, for some of the students, they're so used to having uh, online classes and whatnot, um, they prefer to remain at home uh, and they hope that classes will continue uh, forever. Um, Therefore, as you can see, uh, I think earlier, Prof. Kairudian mentioned about uh, Milton Friedman uh, notion, right? Now we see that more and more people are rejecting uh, the old uh, Milton Friedman notion that the only social responsibility of business is to maximize profit. Right. This, is, this social responsibility, uh, that, that is what uh, Milton Friedman has been uh, promoting, right? Right. Yeah, in the, the, the younger workforce now thinks that business should also be trying to make a positive difference in the world. Right? They want to see changes taking place. Uh, I have one at home who is very concerned, more concerned about the environment than anything else. So why should we stop caring about the thing that matters us when we go to work, right? So when, go, when you go to your, to, your, to your offices or when the entrepreneurs start thinking about um, on how to enhance sales, produce more goods, right? They should, they, they have, they should start caring about the things uh, that are around, around us. Now, that comes back to the issue of green business, right? Now, um, there are a lot of definition being used uh, on what a green business is all about. Um, I have quite a number of uh, students now who want to start up a business. They say they want to become a social entrepreneur because they feel that uh, they want to contribute more uh, to a business environment. I said, no, you don't have to be a social entrepreneur to do that, right? You can, you can, you can be an entrepreneur at the same time you are more concerned about the sustainability of the environment. So a green uh, industry business uh, based on uh, Max Friedman definition, uh, which came out in the published in Business News Daily in March 16, 2020, he says that a green industry business is one that uses sustainable materials to make its products, right? Green industry business aim to use as little water as possible, as little energy as possible, and as little raw materials as possible while cutting carbon emission or find ways to utilize these materials in renewable and eco-friendly ways. This business approach minimizes the company's strain on natural resources and contributes to climate change. In some cases, if waste is generated, it is reused as energy or raw material. Now, I had the opportunity um, to befriend um, a business owner in a place called Kuantan, where uh, she, she uses uh, renewable energy. Uh, she's more into food business. Uh, and she, she uses uh, re recyclable materials. And all because of because her children, because of her concern for her children and her children want it to be that way. So as you can see, the, the, the interest is getting stronger now than before. Uh, sustainable business model, which is, uh, this is another issue. Uh, we were discussing just now uh, in, in the workshop uh, earlier, um, is that what do you mean by sustainable business model? And what do you mean by business model sustainability? Now, most companies are talking about sustainable business model. In a, in a way, what they mean is, how do you sustain your, your, your company uh, for the future? Whereas a business model for sustainability is basically, you develop a business model with a priority towards sustainability. So therefore, if you look at uh, the definition uh, a sustainable business model is what every business leaders hope to achieve, that the business will turn a profit quickly and stay afloat for the long term, all right? She said, sorry, I quote this from someone else. I, I, I did not have the time to uh, cite the name of the person. Uh, she said, a business model that prioritizes sustainability is one that at a minimum considers all stakeholders, assesses and addresses environmental impacts and is transparent and thorough in its reporting. This is about, uh, as Prof K said earlier, this is about being transparent, right? Um, we have cases where uh, companies are being audited uh, 
and after being audited, we found out that there's a lot of fake reports coming uh, from the company. A business model for sustainability can be defined as a supporting, a supporting voluntary or many voluntary activities that solve or moderate social or environmental problems. Remember, this is voluntary. We don't make it uh, compulsory. Business model for sustainability is actively managed in order to create customer and social value by integrating social, environmental, and business activity. So when we integrate the three together, social, environment, and business activity, so what we have here is what we call a business model for sustainability. Now, more and more companies are going into a business model for sustainability, uh, hoping that um, their business uh, will help to preserve uh, the sustainability of the environment. Now, what makes a sustainable business model, or um, um, how, how, how do you, how do you uh, know that your business model is sustainable? Number one, of course, it must be commercially profitable. Um, number two, it can succeed far in the future. We don't want to build our castle on a sinking rock, right? You want to be built on a solid foundation. Uh, and, and our resources can be utilized for the long term. So basically, when you talk about resources that can be recycled or resources that can be reused, um, um, that is what we mean by uh, long term. Um, and and some, some resources can be easily available, but yet environmentally harmful. So, uh, of course, it, some people say that it may, it may be expensive uh, to focus on the environmental uh, resources, environmentally uh, uh, env less harmful to the environment, but it's costly. But then let's think about the future, right? We, when you talk about profit, we are talking about short-term uh, impact, but we are looking at long-term impact, okay? Um, um, and then it gives back. One theory is that a truly sustainable business model is one that gives back as much as it takes. Now, this concept is called the cyclical borrow use return model. Now, Bob Willard, an expert and author in quantifiable sustainable strategies, contrasts this with the current uh, linear take make waste model. There is so many modern businesses I built upon, which he state that, uh, which he state is capable of contributing to this world and sustainability. So in a linear economy, we mine raw material and we process it into a product, then we throw it away after use. But in a circular economy, uh, we close the cycle of all this raw material and we, we, we either we recycle or we use it as a renewable energy. I've got a few more slides. Uh, now, I would like to quote uh, what Paul Paulman has said, the CEO of Unilever. Now, according to him, business leaders must recognize that in global value chain, there is no way to outsource environmental or social responsibility. In other words, the responsibility um, of uh, being environmentally or socially responsible must be with the company or with the organization. We, don't, we, don't, we should not outsource it to others to do it. It is our own responsibility. And on the contrary, multinational companies can and must use the extended supply chain to drive and improve the quality of life in the market where they operate, right? Irrespective whether they are in the country where uh, they manufacture or in another country uh, or some other country where they, where they, they did their manufacturing. So basically, uh, they need to improve the quality of life, right? Whether the manufacturing is in Indonesia, whether it is in, in Pakistan or even in India, right? They must, um, they must be concerned and they must, they must be uh, they must be environmentally and socially responsible. Now, this is, I think this is my, my final slides. Now, how fast are we moving? Now, despite some progress in SDGs over the past three years, we are not moving fast enough, right? I will, I will, uh, as I can see, more and more companies, uh, although there are more and more companies are concerned about the environment, but if you look at the business model, uh, you can see that not many companies are incorporating the SDGs, right? Uh, especially countries like uh, on this part of the world, uh, they're not they're not concerned about the SDGs. As Winston Churchill once said, "I never worry about action, only in action." Right? 
So basically, they are. We can see that uh, more and more. Uh, th although there are more and more uh, companies that are more concerned about action, but we can see many more companies who just don't really care. Right? Look at the incident of the Kim Kim River. Um, I think they already caught the culprit, uh, and action has been taken. Okay. Now uh, that wisdom should shape our approach to business and the SDGs today. Now, with respect to the Kim Kim River that I have mentioned earlier, uh, the effect is going to be long lasting. It's going to take years for the river to recover. Right? Um, I, I, I once went there. Uh, it is a source of income uh, for, for the community uh, surrounding the river, but now they have lost their source of income. So basically, it affects almost everyone. The world we want for our children will arrive only when we choose action over indifference, courage over comfort, and solidarity over division. With that, I end my presentation today. Um, I think we can have some uh, discussion, questions and answers. Uh, maybe we can, we can discuss further. I'm sure uh, you're coming from a different country. You may have a different uh, approach. You may have a different experience. Um, but um, 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 but this is something that we can discuss. I think the issue is still common. Um, we hope to see that uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, companies um, are being actively involved uh, in 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 in, uh, in in maintaining or being socially or environmentally responsible. With that, I pass over back to Dr. Wisdom. Thank you very much. Hey, where's Dr. Wisdom? <laughs> so he, he must be thinking you're still not finished yet. Ah, uh, okay. Maybe we can yes, open bro. up. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, bro. Yeah. I will prefer because to I, to... I, I had to jump to another uh, room. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh really? back. Okay, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Okay, bro. So thank you so much for uh, your interesting talk. And I think... Uh, now we open the floor uh, for Q&A from the participants. So please, if you have any question, you can type uh, your question in the chat box. Uh, so maybe, maybe I start... Uh, uh, this is just uh, because I think we had uh, a debate uh, previously, Prof. K, on uh, uh, your argument about the artificial intelligence and the smart. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, because to me, when I talk about smart uh, cities, smart apps, uh, I, I like uh, the idea and I promote the idea that the, those smart uh, 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 technologies, and uh, if we talk about the smart city, uh, and there is a lot of definition, by the way, that those smart technologies should make the city more human, more safe, more resilient, right? Not taking the smart technologies in the perspective that they need to control a human, right? And I always refer to the incident in Japan last few years. Ah, I'm when the to robots, say. Yeah, yeah, when the robots yeah. killed 15, I think 15 or 12 scientists. Yes, yes, yes. Because I'm always wondering why we need to give the control over our life to the robotics. Yeah, exactly. But I can, I, I, you know, there is a lot of uh, usage of robotics and it's been in the market. Like... The robotics can put off fires, can help the bomber, like uh, the civil defense, to put off fires or to dismantle a bomb, yes. right? Yes. Or I seen a lot of apps from like Hitachi. Mm. They use the smart apps to improve the quality of uh, in the industry, not for the robotics to take over the place of the human. Exactly. So because. As, as as you rightly put it, uh, Professor, what you say, uh, if you can, if I can crystallize it in a nutshell, what you are yes. saying is, uh, is uh, you mentioned, I was going to say, but you already read my mind. It's, it is uh, Society 5.0. That's what Japan is doing now. 
Yes. Am I right? Yes. That's right. Yes. In other words, you're looking at technology, but you're using technology for the good of mankind. True. You're absolutely right. True. Sorry for, for interjecting. No, it's, it's, you know, it's just because previously I, I, I was in a discussion and mm. then uh, mm. they mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, about the social aspects. Yes. So I always wonder, uh, like, okay, we have a lot of technologies now and talking about artificial intelligence, right? Mm. So I was wondering, is there any study being done on the social impacts of those technologies? Right. Social right? impact, yes. Yeah. And then I gave one example. Yeah. And this is uh, 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 very relevant to the Malaysian scenario. And it is also relevant to other countries. So in Malaysia, for example, previously for the toll collectors, uh -huh. we have in each put, you have one human, one uh, uh, individual, yes. right? One staff. But now most of those tolls converted Nobody. either to touch and go or a smart tag, yes. or now they have the RFID, right. right? So maybe now they have one or maximum two. Instead of eight. Yeah, it's, they have eight human now, they only have two, right? Yes. So now this is a very relevant and very real time scenario, which can be studied. What happens to the rest of those uh, individuals? Is yeah. it they yeah. lost their jobs yeah. or they've been promoted or they got a better job, right? Because definitely when we have high unemployment, that might uh, cause social tension that might rise the crime rate, yes. right? So this is kind of the things that we need to investigate when and we talk since, about the smart technologies. Since you, since you mentioned it, interesting, uh, Rizal, not many people know that some of those people working in the toll booth are actually, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, how do you call it? What, what do you call these people? Handicapped people, you know, some people, yeah, they, they, are, they, are, they are good Especially looking. Needs. Uh, yeah, they, they are mute. Some of them can't speak. Some of them uh, can't talk. I know, but uh, they sign language. Quite a few of them. So you you uh, you asked uh, pertinent, very uh, valid question. What happened to them? Because I think uh, those uh, the tall. I mean, just talking about the tall. It, it provided opportunity for employment for this uh, uh, group of people. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. That, what what happened to them? Yeah. Uh, and you know, we are the one who decide whether we want to utilize these technologies or not. Right. So the human who will decide. That's why we need to have, we can utilize, but we, we need to, to have the last say. We need to decide when and where and for what we need those uh, uh, technologies. Let's uh, see the questions here. I think uh, we have some question in the chat box. So uh, somebody is asking, uh, green business definitely is a very key to sustainability. However, in countries like Uganda, uh, the majority of the investors are foreign and so are more in profitability other than sustainability. How can we help change this kind of mindset? Maybe this is for uh, Professor Hassan. Yeah, there, there are two questions here that uh, concerns me very much. Yeah. Uh, number one is with regard to what the foreign companies are doing in uh, here in our own country, for example. And there was also another question with regard to the SMEs, mm. um, being small, medium. Uh, there are, of course, the resources are limited. Um, so basically, uh, how do you how do you ensure sustainability? Uh, in uh, socially, socially and environmentally uh, sustainable? It's a good question, actually. Now, um, I think depending on how the enforcement, uh, it also, I think it depends on the uh, laws and regulation of the country with regard to environmental issues and also the, enf the enforcement. Um, some uh, countries like Malaysia, for example, we have a government-linked companies uh, the Alam Flora, which provides uh, uh, which provides uh, facilities for toxic waste uh, management uh, at a certain amount of fee, right? And um, and they will collect. They will go and send the trucks to collect the toxic waste uh, before it is being uh, released on the river. And uh, and then I think another issue is that uh, what we're doing in Malaysia, for example, we are creating 
uh, based on the King Tim River incident, we have started to create uh, uh, NGOs, uh, which we work with NGOs that are looking into the uh, into the environmental, uh, into the cleanliness of the rivers. Uh, we have two or three universities now working with a number of communities to clean up the river tributaries, and they also have uh, watchdogs or people to watch and make reports if there are any incidents of companies dumping waste into the river. So as you can see, for example, there was one river in the state of Slango. Um, the river is so crystal clear, unlike what it was a few years ago, because three universities was involved with the community to clean up the river. And now they're working with the companies that are situated next to, to the river bank. And they are creating, and they're also educating uh, the people who stays close to the river bank not to throw rubbish, right? Now, for the SME, this is quite interesting because uh, what the government should do is, or what they're doing in Malaysia, for example, uh, the government are giving out a uh, grant, for example, to SMEs uh, so that, um, especially startup SMEs, so that they can, uh, they can, they can dispose uh, their waste in, in, in the right manner. Um, until the company is able uh, to, to finance on its own uh, the toxic waste material. And uh, with regard to the um, international companies, it's quite, it's quite sad because some of these companies, they practice uh, environmental uh, concern in their own countries, but when they are in some other countries, they just couldn't care less, right? They do, they do not even respect the rules of the law of the country. And then again, as I said earlier, it is a matter of en uh, enforcement. How, how do we enforce uh, the rules and regulation? I'm sure every country has their own rules and laws that, uh, that uh, is used to protect uh, the environment. So it's a matter of how, 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 how serious are we, are we uh, in implementing it? I think Malaysia is quite serious in that sense. Uh, with respect to the Kim Kim River, I think they did a swift move um, and they managed to capture the culprit. So then again, the community plays a very important role here as well. So there should be a collaboration uh, between the government, the company, and also the community um, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, these companies are uh, being watched uh, they, 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 uh, in, in a way that um, they have to be careful um, if, they, if they did something which goes against the law, then there are, people, there are always people who will report them uh, to the relevant authorities. So I think enforcement is another way. Education is another way to educate uh, people, to educate uh, the companies. I think Malaysia, in a way, uh, we, I've seen a lot of rivers in Malaysia are now getting cleaner, clearer, uh, mm -hmm. compared for the last couple of years. That shows that... Uh, there is a collaboration, cooperation between the communities, companies, and, and even the universities. Okay, that, that is my, 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 um, my part of the command. Um, yeah, I, 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 okay, would like to add anything else? Sorry, I, <laughs> I was busy taking photograph. I, I lost. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, right. okay, okay, uh, I, I think there is another point here. Uh, where it is highly likely that businesses need to scale up yes. at the cost of environment. How do we how do we phase out an intervention which encompass societal benefits and minimal cost of the environment? I, I just I just uh, can I just just add uh, sure. yes, on, on top yes, on top of my head. Now you're talking about green, uh, which is important to remind because uh, in the in the early, earlier part in the historical. I won't say talk about the earlier part of this this effort. You know, uh, we talk about green sustainability, green technology. Um, people do not do not seem to understand, or people uh, it seems to mention about companies and stuff like that. You know, property developers and uh, you know they 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 take the word green as a face value. For example, mm -hmm. just like my slide, I started off with putting it green. Actually, I I I purposely did that because I wanted to highlight the point that in in those days when they first started to have this consciousness, awareness about green. Green technology means is if you go to the restroom, um, when you flush your, your, your toilet, there's just enough amount of water. 
Okay. Yes. And then and and electricity in the house. Um, so you know uh, the elements that they use. It's cheaper electricity. And it's optimizing energy and 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 things like that. And that is basically what green is all about. Not uh, having the whole building being painted green. You find that they they were they they were, they were saying okay now we are using green technology, but actually there's nothing green about about it. They just Mm. Painted the whole building. Am I right, Prophet? They just painted yes, yes, the building. Right, right. So, right. so uh, mm -hmm. someone asked the questions now. So, I think it's important for the young people to understand the 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 concept uh, is important. Uh, understanding and the, the the buying so that so that uh, generally all over the world when we talk about green technology, people understand what you're talking about. That that's that's uh, um, what I wanted to share, Prophet. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right in that sense. Um, I, th I think education is very important. Um, we need to educate uh, our, our young people uh, because, uh, I mean, during my time when I was small, uh, I would go and swim in the river. Uh, but you can't, you can't, you, you can't find rivers uh, that they're clean enough as uh, it was many, many years ago. Yeah, so we need to educate yeah. the younger yeah. generation yeah. about the importance of of uh, of of of, the, uh, of uh, maintaining. Uh, uh, or being concerned about our environment. And, uh, and, they, and some, some have not even seen a, a buffalo. They only see it on their smartphone. In reality, they haven't seen it. You, yeah. have, you have that situation too. I remember I was climbing one mountain uh, in huh? Malaysia. Uh, it took me about two hours to climb up. Oh. Um, then uh, I, I met a, a group of uh, school children from one country. Let's not mention which country. Right. Uh, um, I asked them, uh, why don't you go and climb a small mountains? Your no, it's not. It's not. It's not, a, it's not there anymore, right? It has been mown down. Right? Oh. The hills, sorry, the hills have been mown down to make way for progress. So basically, they they realize that they have to go to another country to experience uh, uh, mountain climbing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in other words, they are they are, they are very concerned about it. Okay, uh, something that is missing. And uh, this is something that, I say, as I said earlier, education plays a very important role, right? Um, I know there are a lot of countries where, in developing countries like uh, Ethiopia, for example, um, it's difficult to enforce uh, SDG in private businesses uh, because some company, they just couldn't care. Like, they are more thinking about profit, right? right? Well, that was why in Malaysia, for example, we have grant coming from the government uh, that is only given for companies that are very concerned uh, with the environment, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't, you don't, you want our grant, then you have to ensure that your production line is in line with the SDGs. Right. right? Ensure that the you are very, uh, you take up steps to ensure that you do not pollute the environment. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and if you do, then uh, what the government will do is they will take back your, your 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 business license. You cannot operate at all. So as I said earlier, it's education and it's also. Um, with respect to uh, enforcement and governance. It's very important. Um, sometimes the issue of uh, corruption also plays a very important role that hinders um, uh, a country from uh, enforcing um, what they've already planned earlier. So this is the issue. I think education plays a very important role. We need to educate uh, our people. Uh, Prof, maybe you want to respond to this guy question. When a new entrepreneur comes into business field, how can he or she incorporate green business concept in their business? That is very uh, true. Yeah, because yep, there's a yep. lot of new business ideas uh, coming up uh, lately uh, mm. where you can incorporate a uh, uh, green business concept. I'll give you one example. I Recently, I met one entrepreneur uh, who has been using uh, rainwater to water his, uh, his, uh, um, uh, his plantation. Mm. Right? Okay, in Malaysia, we have abundance of rainwater rather than being seen the water being wasted. Right. So we use a certain technology. Again, technology, as Prof. Prof. Kavirin said, is very important. Yeah. Uh, he uses a certain technology to tap every inch of rainwater within his uh, plantation. Right. And every amount of rainwater that he taps is being used uh, to the maximum. He uh, mines mm. the rainwater to water his plantation. In other words, he is uh, recycling. Exactly, yes. Yeah, right. So this is one way that you can you can do uh, you can incorporate. Another way is by, uh, for example, avoid waste. For example, right, avoid waste and uh, keep on recycling uh, the waste uh, so that you can you can avoid um, uh, dumping the waste uh, unnecessarily. Now, when when I was in the UK, for example, 
uh, when I was studying there, we are, we are, I mean, we are, we are, I mean, being a student, we don't have much money to spend on. So we would buy our stuff at the car boot sale. Hmm. That is a good example <laughs> of, yes, recycling. I miss car boot sale, Prof. I miss the car boot sale. And, and the, as you can see, Malaysia has started to, uh, to that, that is awareness to that, rather than dumping old clothes and yeah, creating right. all, yeah, environmental issue. Now we see that uh, a lot of social enterprises are coming up where they will go around and collect whatever clothing or whatever stuff that you want to throw away, give it to us, we'll have to... Uh, and they do their own uh, version of kabut sale. Right, yeah. <laughs> and we, we sell more price. And uh, with that money, we, we, we can use to educate uh, the community about uh, being environmental friendly and whatnot. Even they use the money to educate the companies. Mm. about being uh, environmentally concerned uh, in, in, within the uh, right or oh, recycling key yes recycling i like that yeah right mm -hmm. uh, okay or anything else uh there's one question according to agenda 21 of united nation for the pillars of sustainability has been incorporated can you elaborate how these pillars be used to attain sustainability yeah the cultural i agree mm. um as, yeah, as I said earlier, it, it is uh, culture makes uh, is another issue that we need uh, to change. Um, um, for example, uh, the way we uh, our, our working habit, our, our daily habit, uh, we need to change. For example, I'm I'm into cycling, right? Now some people say, oh, in Malay country like Malaysia, it's so hot to cycle, right? So why should you cycle to work? Uh, so what's happening now is that more and more people are, are concerned about the issue of environment, about carbon footprint. So uh, some of us are now trying to stay closer to the workplace so that they can cycle more to work. Um, and I think now Malaysian government, for example, has changed. Uh, our, it's trying, has started to change our habit where uh, uh, we are allowed to bring your cycle, as your bicycle, as long as it is folded into our, our train so that you can take it with you and you can cycle to work. Uh, that is a uh, work culture. Now, we also have other cultures that we need to change. Uh, for example, the way, the way uh, we do things like um, uh, wastage, for example. Uh, I know in, in Malaysia being a Muslim country during the month of Ramadan, uh, there is a lot of food being thrown up. Okay, That's being culture. Yeah. yeah, that's culture. culture. Culture, yes. Yeah. We need to change uh, how we prepare ourselves for iftar, for example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to buy so many food. After all, that was, is what, what Ramadan is all about, right? Uh, I mean, trying to uh, minimize uh, and trying to uh, sort of like uh, live a very moderate life. Um, so these are the things. Our culture, we need to change our habit. And uh, I, I think uh, maybe Prof K would like to add on that as well. No, because culture, I think the uh, question that was talking about the Agenda 21 of the UN Force Pillar, eh? sustainability, mm -hmm. that, that has been incorporated, culture, because that is the most, in anything you will know that culture is the most difficult, you can change a person, you know, right. you can change, uh, what do you call a group, but culture takes a longer time to change, it's right. very challenging, and I think uh, that is the, uh, the UN has actually uh, really, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Take, take, taken up the challenge because that's mm -hmm. most is what's most difficult thing to do to change the culture. Yeah, I, I remember uh, this hotel in Genting Highland um, because uh, when when you go there and dine, uh, it's buffet. You mm. take whatever you want, and then suddenly you just couldn't finish the food. So what they do now is they will weigh the food that you did not finish, and they will charge back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know about that. <laughs> yeah. So, now it, the culture has changed. When people go for the, to to dine, when they go for a buffet dinner, they will make sure that they take. They, they be very careful. They only yes. take what they want and they eat. Right. Yeah. 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 I know. Those, I know. Uh, I've experienced it actually. <laughs> because yeah. then if you tell them why are you taking so much, why are you wasting food, yeah. and they will look right. at you, you know, and then they will tell you, uh, so what? Uh, why are you bother? Yeah. It's my money. Okay, I'm paying for it, so I can take whatever. That's the attitude. Okay, I can take whatever that I want to eat and leave it there. Which is wrong. This is contributing to you know uh, these issues of uh, pollution, sustainability, wastage, and all that. You know, a lot of things uh, are coming up. So, but you're right, brother. So one, very, but it's it's a more or less uh, what's the word they use? It's a, a very much a, a very a punitive way of doing it. I'm sure yeah. there are other better ways to do. It. 
Sorry, Dr. Isam, you were going to something? Yeah, uh, you know, talking about culture as a uh, pillar of uh, sustainability or as a fourth pillar. Fourth pillar, uh, yeah. Yeah, so how do you see if you want to talk about uh, governance, the importance of governance? Uh, to me, from uh, some practices, I see governance is more important to be, to be considered as maybe fourth or fifth pillar of sustainability. Mm. Because, about, like, I'll just I'll just give you one uh, example, and I think it's common in in many countries. Yeah. Like you take just where the water sector. Water sector. How many agencies handling the water sector? Mm. Definitely, you are talking about local councils, state right. government, uh, right. federal government, JBS, so JKR. Right. So at least, and this is common to me. I see the worst case scenario uh, previously in 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 Palestine. Uh -huh. Because, you know, there's a lot of challenges over there. So normally, normally, if you have an achievement, everybody will claim that this is their achievement. Yeah, uh, and if there is funding from one agency, everybody will uh, uh, say Scramble that this is it. our responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But if there is a problem, water pollution, there is a dam, uh, you, you know, uh, flooding or whatever, Nobody will say that this is our fault or this is our responsibility. So in mm. this case, you will see that the main uh, uh, reason for delaying or for uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 damaging the sustainability uh, practices, it is the governance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I, I what you call, um, therefore, what you just mentioned, uh, accurately or precisely brings you back to governance. If you have good governance, yes. then you will straight away know who is responsible for what. True, mm -hmm. true, yeah. true. Because it's, it's not about technology. It's yes. about governance. Yes. Take for example, uh, in Malaysia, our, our uh, the secretary for the uh, environment and, and, and uh, resources, right? Mm. Uh, he's known as, uh, his name is Zainu Chang. He's a professor at the universities. He's a water expert. So basically, if you put the right people at the right position, and I think the uh, issue of governance will solve many things. But that's uh, ideal, Prof. Yes. That's, that's, a, that's an ideal situation. Yeah. In reality, uh, not often do, do we get the, the, you know, get the privilege you know, to, yeah. to uh, fulfill what you just uh, said. Am I right, man? Yeah. yeah, you're right. Finding the right people, the right yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I agree with you. Uh, governance is a very important thing. Um, even when you talk about academic uh, in universities, academic governance is very important to ensure that we produce uh, quality education. The so same thing here when you talk about uh, energy governance, you have you may have the best uh, laws in the world, but when as far as governance is not there, so basically it defeats the purpose. But then again, how do you ensure that there is a proper governance? as far as uh, energy, for example, environment. Uh, um, that's why I say this, this also takes, uh, to me, education is very important, right? Um, if you, you, this thing should be highlighted at schools at a very young age uh, on the issue of uh, being environmentally uh, conscious and whatnot. I know Singapore is very good at this. Mm. Right? Uh, Singapore, they, at, the very, at the kindergarten level, they're really stressed uh, this issue that you being a small country, very limited resources, right? We have to be very concerned about the environment. We have to be very careful about our limited resources like water um, and, 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 and electricity and whatnot. Right. Uh, sorry, I want to interject because when you talk about governance, two uh, important fundamental drivers about mm -hmm. governance. Eh? When you talk about good governance, which means you say that uh, you pay attention to two things. Ethics, which I mentioned in my event. Ethics, and the other one is corruption. Yeah. You have to deal with this. So yeah. if you understand this concept, and if you can tackle the issue of corruption, okay, corruption comes in many different forms, okay? And it is defined differently, again, in different uh, jurisdictions and in different societies and in different nations. Similarly, as I mentioned again in my presentation earlier on about ethics, Again, ethics is very elusive. Okay, that's why I said uh, redefining ethics. You know, what is ethical to you may not be ethical in another society. I think this is a fundamental global uh, problem. And I, that's the reason 
that United Nations should uh, be mindful of this, uh, Dr. Rishab. Mm -hmm. I think uh, these are the challenges that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rishab. Yes, yes, yeah? yes, true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think here there are some questions. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah. Is there a checklist to enforce green yeah. uh, practices by the SMEs? Yeah, if there is a such checklist, is it right. a formal guideline? There, there are. Um, I think you can easily find them over on the internet. In fact, when I was right. uh, searching on green technology mm -hmm. uh, this morning, I found out there's a lot of uh, checklists that you can uh, you can use as a as a guideline, uh, and uh, you can just adopt any any of them. Um, in, in Malaysia, for example, we do have a lot of uh, agencies that are concerns uh, with regard to uh, green, uh, green businesses. Um, and I think the most important thing is not just having the checklist, but we need also to have uh, people who will govern and enforce uh, the necessary, uh, the necessary um, uh, enforcement or whatever. To mm. ensure that the green energy is being uh, implemented, yeah. uh, but, but then <laughs> this is very specifically mostly voluntary. Right. Yes. Uh, well, no, no, uh, sorry, uh, I'm interested. I saw this comment that was made, <laughs> which which, which uh, caught my attention. The more fun you get from community, the more responsible you are. So, are you implying that I can interpret it as saying so? So, the less fun you get from the community, so uh, does it mean that you you have the right to also to become irresponsible? No, I no? Think is that a passport? Is that a passport for you to become irresponsible because you're not getting a lot of money? So, if you get a lot of money from the community, means you have to be responsible. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just try, trying to uh, uh, interpret, uh, you know, <laughs> that that remark. I think the remark was made. Uh, to mean that you know, uh, to talk about to relate responsibility with funding, <laughs> which yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 you, should, uh, you should also read the next uh, message uh, comment. Despite the source of funding, the more you engage the community, the more responsible you. I I, I prefer the second comment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the, community, yeah the community is very important. I've said exactly, exactly. To get the community yeah. walk right. Uh, take for example the Kim Kim River incident. When it happened, initially nobody does anything when they see trucks dumping uh, the waste into the river. Right. Look at, right. Uh, when 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 people start getting headaches, uh, when uh, people started to vomit, then they realize the seriousness of the yeah, incident. Right, exactly. Yeah. So now the people are more engaged. When they see a truck driving through, they will start following and start uh, uh, monitoring the truck. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here there is yes, Prof. Yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, here there is a comment or a question as well. Uh, I want to know if the IMF really helping the developing nations to meet the Agenda 2030 with some of their uh, hard conditions. If yes, what what is the sustainability behind it? If no, what are the healing ways to forward uh, uh, those nations? I'm, I'm not, I cannot respond to that because I'm not sure whether they do or not. Uh, I think Malaysia, basically, we do not really uh, submit to IMF. Uh, exactly. We, you're right, Professor. We have never really uh, paid attention. If you remember at some point in time before, uh, during the last uh, economic crisis, our mm -hmm. Prime Minister then didn't pay attention to what was uh, directed or what was uh, recommended by IMF. We took the other way road. So, so I'm not sure. But even... I think it, it now uh, there's not much. I don't hear much about the IMF talking about a lot of things. Maybe they may have uh, funding issues. You know, the, the big boys who are supposed to give them fund because all these uh, bodies, the, uh, their operation is dependent on funding from di different nations. Okay, and uh, so uh, if you look, it's interesting. If you've seen some of the, the person mentioned IMF, that's one. The other thing in there is the World Trade Organization. They are a bit quiet now. So because, uh, again, it's interesting what's going on. Because uh, globalization also, uh, again, my favorite. I always tell people, go and read my favorite uh, person uh, by the name of, uh, what is his name? Um, the end of, um, he is the husband of the former governor general of Canada. 
and he talks a lot about the uh, globalization and he, he's, he, you can google and uh, or look at youtube and listen to his uh, program on television uh, the end of globalism i, I forgot his name <laughs> yeah his end of globalism but he he's, he's really interesting he was talking about uh, and whatever he said is related to what we're talking now we're related to about uh, sustainability uh, in, uh, and about uh, imf about funding about, about the world bodies what's going on who is controlling what It's interesting because in 1999, when he gave a lecture at the Australian National University, he, he mentioned this. He said that this whole world is actually being controlled by eight or nine huge multinational corporations, MNCs, because their profit, their turnover alone is bigger than, more than uh, some of the small countries in the world. So it's interesting. I mean, some of us, you know, uh, some of the participants probably may, may like to take a look. I, I forgot his name, but uh, you just Google him. He's the guy who talks about uh, the end of globalism. So I, I would think that uh, he's, he's very involved now uh, with this association of, uh, of writers, global writers. The name just doesn't come off uh, you know, my, my brain at the moment. Yeah? Okay, Prabhasan, maybe you want to see something? Yeah, um, I think we already reached uh, our time, right? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yes. Right, almost. So I think, I think we, we need to conclude here. Uh, right. So thank you so much, uh, Prof. Hassan and Prof. K for your interesting uh, uh, presentations and also uh, the response to the uh, feedback to the question and uh, answers. So uh, again, I would like to thank everybody for joining this session. Uh, Dr. Achib, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you want to comment or conclude anything? I think today it's a really great uh, discussion about it's very relevant for every countries. We want to know in the future what the landscape our uh, countries and our cooperation between uh, among the countries. It really it is relevant then and, and it's uh, our concern I think uh, to implement the best uh, solution for the economic uh, sustainability. I think it's really uh, relevant for us and many, many participants uh, love this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much for a very uh, honor, respected uh, speaker from um, Malaysia. It's really uh, helpful for us. And I think... Uh, We need uh, follow up for implementation for this one, not only mm -hmm. discussion. I think uh, it really big contribution from us if can solve the our community for this one. Thank you, Dr. Thank Wesson. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chip. Okay, again, thank you so much, Prof. Hassan, Prof. K, and thanks everybody. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, yeah, still great uh, discussion about yes. governance. Government, uh, social, yeah. social sustainability and uh, accounting for sustainability as well. Okay. Yes, very important for the policy as well. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank Have you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Assalamualaikum. Salam. Not to be some.